The planting of seeds is as old as gardening itself. The timeless sowing of sustainable crops, cultivating the soil from brown gold to a colorful oasis. But times change and practices improve. Sowing certain crops early indoors or in shelter conditions throughout the year allows us to extend our growing seasons to bigger and better harvests more reliably. Every winter and spring, keen gardeners look forward to pre-starting their seeds early indoors to get a jump start on the season. And rightly so. Starting our warm weather crops ahead of time is just smart business. And for many of us with short summers, it's actually a necessity. But it's only as successful as the foundation we build upon. And by that, I mean the soil. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms, and I've been starting my seeds early indoors for over two decades. In fact, it was once my job, growing and selling tens of thousands of starter plants every spring. And really, I was only able to do this with the right soil. Seed starting soil is a different animal than regular garden soil. So today, let's find out why that is and make some of our own in the process. A trip to the local nursery or hardware store quickly shows us that there's many, many different types of soil. And there are. While many are redundant and there is some overlap, each one of these soils is designed with a purpose. Potting soils for containers, garden soils for building up our sunken raised beds, and top soils for landscaping purposes. One specialized soil that can't be mistaken is seeding or seed starting soil. And that's the one we're going to focus on today. Commercial seed starting soils like this one are almost always peat based and they're designed with the seeds in mind. That means high moisture retention, but also good drainage. Excellent aeration for the young roots and light and fluffy overall to allow for zero shoot and root restrictions. Oddly enough, Seeding soils often contain no soil at all. Sounds weird, I know, but it makes sense when you think about it. We'll get into why that is in just a bit, but let's first finish up with the commercial mixes. In many cases, you're also gonna find that some of your store-bought soils, well, they're gonna contain other things as well. Things like growth enhancers, mycorrhizae, wetting agents, as well as a hefty price tag. You see, the average grower is only ever going to need a small volume, so why not charge an absolute premium for it, right? Because of this, after a few seasons, and for those of us doing more than a couple of plants, we turn to making our own. But why not just use your own compost or even your garden soils? Well, you can, no doubt. I've done it before, but it does come with some pretty major pitfalls. For one, it's just not ideal. Soils from our garden and our compost are almost never uniform. They're often too heavy and they compact way too easily. Trust me, whenever you see pictures of people wondering why their seedlings are failing or why they're not growing properly, it's almost always because of the soil they used. On top of that, our garden soils and compost are teeming with life. And under normal circumstances, that's a good thing. Microbes, nematodes, beneficial bacteria, and all the other fauna working in complete harmony in a web of interactions using the natural checks and balances. Constrained in an indoor, often warmer environment, well, it's a recipe for disaster. Gnats, damping off, pest and fungal outbreaks, those are the norm. Okay, so if we're not going to use commercial mixes, and soils from our garden or our compost are out of the question, what do we use? Well, I'm glad you asked. Remember how we said seeding soils often don't contain any soil at all? Well, there's a reason for that, and it's because of the seeds themselves. You see, seeds are these amazing dormant vessels that when you just add water to them, well, they explode into this cavalcade of life. But while truly awesome, this much we already know. But what many people don't know though, is that those seeds are designed to keep feeding those young plants for upwards of two weeks past germination. 
your seeds are going to sprout what's called a root nodule before anything else. Designed more for anchoring and the orientation of the plant rather than nutrient uptake, this modified root is followed by the cotyledons or seed leaves. It isn't until well after the first true leaves appear that the plant actually begins to actively look for food with its root network. Because of this, seeding soils don't need to contain any nutrients of any kind, nor do they even really need soil. And while that's okay for commercial mixes, for me, I do like a small amount of soil or compost in my mix. It seems to give the plants a bit of an edge. I feel like it gives them longevity at each potting stage, and the nutrient retention seems just a little bit higher than a straight up sterile mix. Now, it's not enough to hold the plants all the way until it's time for them to go in the garden, but it buys an extra couple of weeks right away so we're not scrambling to feed our young plants immediately. Alright, so what is the ideal mix? Well, for me, I like to use 75% cocoa fiber, or peat if you have to, 25% compost, and then take that volume and add in 10% each of perlite and vermiculite. Mix it all together, and that is a superior seed starting mix. Any seeds, tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, zucchinis, basil, cilantro, dill, melons, corn, brassicas, lettuce, you name it. The cocoa fiber is going to act as your main base. The compost is going to give you those benefits that we just talked about. Vermiculite is going to add in moisture retention as well as structure. And to top it off, the perlite is going to add in aeration as well as keep that drainage above average. Remember, just like we talked about, I do recommend using a sterile compost. At the temperatures and humidity that we're going to be germinating at, compost from your backyard could really be a problem. Okay, that's all fine and dandy. A simple seeding soil that just works. But what if you want to elevate it slightly? Is that even possible? Well, I'm glad you asked. There's certain slow release additives that can actually make a superior seeding soil even better. Now, not at all necessary, but dry ingredients such as alfalfa meal, canola meal, and rock phosphate can lie dormant waiting for the plants to mature, releasing valuable macros that only become available as the young plants need them. When they're incorporated into your seeding soil, they can buy your small pots or even your plugs an extra two to four weeks without ever having to be repotted or liquid fed. In some cases, you can even skip the transplant stage to larger pots like this and go straight from plug to garden. So it becomes a time, space, and money saver as well. The beauty is, you don't need much. Just like the vermiculite and perlite, I'll add 10% of the total volume of what I already have of all the ingredients combined. So, it's not 10% alfalfa, plus 10% canola meal, plus 10% rock phosphate. It's 10% of all of them combined. And if you only have one or two of the ingredients, that's fine. It still works. I should mention that there are other dry ingredients that you could add to your seeding soil. Things like rock dust and Epsom salts. But I find that those are in the realm of the soils of when your plants get older. Keeping it simple, it leaves us with two types of seeding soils. If you're doing less than 20 plants, honestly, I say just buy a small bag at the store and be done with it. But if you've elevated your game to seed starting madness every spring, well, making your own is definitely the way to go. I've always made my own and I've never looked back. But one thing we should look back on though are the main points of seeding soils. Here's the 90 second recap you didn't know you needed. Seeds can sprout in just about anything, including water. Not only that, they have all that they need to grow for about two weeks post-germination. As such, most seed starting soils are quite low in nutrients, especially when compared to other available mixes. Usually using peat or cocoa fiber as a base, seeding soils are meant to be light, airy, drain well, and to be obstruction free for both the root networking and shoot development. Pretty straightforward stuff. So, if you're only doing a dozen or so plants for the year, it's probably best to just buy your seeding soil as a single small bag is pretty reasonable. But, for those of you who grow a number of starters every year, 
Well, making your own could be more economical. The mix that I've found to work best over the years consists of 75% cocoa fiber, or peat if you have to, 25% compost, and 10% of that volume in each of perlite and vermiculite. A soft, airy, fluffy mix that seeds just love. Now, if you wanted to take it a step further and enhance that mix a little bit, well, you can do that too. Adding in some dry supplements like alfalfa meal, canola meal, and rock phosphate, that can give you a bit of an edge. It'll allow you to avoid those early fertilizations and they're going to boost the young plants a little bit further into development. Again though, it's not necessary, but it is an option. When you think about it, seeding soils are your favorite crop's first exposure to plant life. Where the roots grow, how do they get there, and how do the young shoots orient themselves for maximum light exposure? And it's the right seeding soil that's going to set up your young plants for the best success. As we've seen, making your own is a super simple endeavor with just three or four ingredients. But hey, even if we don't go the DIY route, at least now we understand why seeding soils are different from regular ones. Hey, best of luck guys, happy seeding. Hey, thanks so much for watching guys. I appreciate the support more than you know. And if you're getting value from these videos, please like and share them to spread the word and help your fellow gardener to grow better.